Uh, good afternoon. Uh, today I'd like to introduce you to some aspects of the marine uh, processing capabilities inside the Intrepid suite of tools. This set of tools um, was developed uh, over 15 years now and initially they were developed in response to uh, the Australian uh, offshore uh, compilation requirements to pull together the uh, gravity, the magnetics and, and indeed the bathymetry data uh, for a uh, uh, to create a coherent representation of the uh, of those data sets uh, for the whole of the offshore continental margins for Australia. So given those challenges the tools have uh, indeed been used uh, uh, to great effect uh, repeatedly to firstly create and then maintain and improve those compilations. So marine, marine it refers to measurements acquired on a moving ship fairly obviously. Uh, here's uh, a small sample on the right hand side, a geodetic uh, gravity survey offshore New Zealand uh, where the question uh, in New Zealand was really uh, when you're measuring the height of the mountains, not the top of the, the mountains, but where do you start from, was the actual uh, difficult question to be solved there, what, what constitutes sea level. Ge geophysical measurements, of course, uh, are many and varied. The ones we're talking about today uh, mostly revolve around bathymetry, gravity magnetics, and uh, more recently uh, gravity gradiometry. Uh, but of course seismic data is usually also acquired offshore at the same time. So acquiring potential field data on a moving platform in a marine environment is challenging in itself. On the picture here you can see the uh, many and varied uh, surveys that were conducted uh, offshore on the east coast of Australia and then down around Tasmania uh, over course of uh, more than 50 years, uh, some of them high quality and some of them quite low quality and the aim was to come up with a way to integrate and make a best fit representation uh, based on that ship track data. <coughs> so the, tr the ship tracks when they're laid out often are not uh, op designed to optimise the, the gravity or the magnetics but they're often designed to uh, for to meet a seismic data acquisition um, uh, challenge. So then uh, we still have to make the most of it to pull that together to get a potential field uh, data set. And uh, depending on the instrument that's installed, uh, there uh, it's usually always for gravity a, a relative measure uh, which has to be converted uh, via calibrations and uh, standard equations to, uh, to create a, uh, a gravity units process. So <clears throat> when you're looking at these, uh, this uh, situation in the broad, uh, you can see here that uh, governments and oil companies and contractors and um, often will use ships uh, typically, even this is a French ship as I recall, uh, French survey ship and they may have a meter like you can see over here on the left the uh, micro G Lacoste um, meter in a stabilized platform for use on a ship or an aircraft and uh, <coughs> that's typical of the of the hardware involved and uh, the, the you get uh, data from various uh, various qualities from various agencies uh, and you pull them together. So pulling them together and then producing a, uh, a best effort compilation of the data is what I'm going to go into now. So we've broken this into five major uh, work blocks and we're going to talk about each one of those work blocks uh, as a subsection. The first one we're going to have a look at is data preparation. 
So moving straight into that. Like all geophysical techniques, one of the most important steps is the actual pre-processing. You have to familiarise yourself with what data you've been given and work out whether you think it's trustworthy and which data uh, are not good and why you think that. And if data isn't um, is found to be uh, inadequate, can it be recovered? Uh, and often uh, in that process you might inadvertently introduce uh, artefacts by the by the measure by the very uh, fact of trying to clean the data up. So this, these are the sorts of traps that you run into. So taking it uh, just as it comes, the first process is to have a look at uh, typically ASCII data that may be delivered. Here's some uh, data that's uh, from uh, near Scandinavia, and uh, in the window here you'll see some uh, GPS type data coming in and it's uh, often got these uh, 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 <coughs> quite mixed formats. Uh, uh, you have north, east, uh, minutes uh, and things like that. There's all sorts of weird and wonderful codes in there. So the first thing to do is to, s to describe that data uh, um, so that Intrepid uh, can import it and create a sort of a unified view uh, of all the data. So we're wanting to find things like the name of the line, the date, the shop points, etc. So <coughs> taking data like that we go to the project manager in Intrepid and we come down and perhaps choose the import ASCII columns wizard and this uh, immediately pops up a tool like this and if you've selected the uh, file that you wish to import you'll get a preview of the uh, some of the records in that file as you see here and the first decision you have to make is is the data delimited uh, by commas or spaces or whatever in this case the uh, the data is uh, is comma delimited so we leave that uh, and there are no header records so we don't have to skip any. <coughs> now pushing the next button just down here we can go to the next pop-up uh, window in the wizard Whoops. and the, the thing that you're asked to do here now is decide whether the data is line data, point data uh, and you pick on a column and you're meant to describe, give a name to each column and then decide whether it's a character or integer real type data, whether it's a, the field is constant for any one line, so we call that a group by, and is it one of the standard uh, fields like an alias, uh, you know, is it the X field or the northing or is it a line number, is it a fiducial and what are the projection and datum if it's a geographic coordinate type thing and of course you have the facility to ignore the column altogether if you wish. So you click on the next and uh, this introduces this uh, idea of the alias. Uh, I just want to go into that now uh, as a side issue temporarily. Uh, Intrepid uh, uh, <coughs> data management system has quite a strong uh, uh, dereferencing of the, the field name in your database, you can ascribe an ASA, you can you can nominate what that field is in terms of its function and we call that the alias. Um, and you can do this at any stage. In this particular case we've got our main um, uh, project manager tool and we're clicking on a database, we're seeing the fields of the database and in this case we under the alias column we've simply put a right mouse button and got the list and by selecting more in that list we can access the standard or marine alias functions so here they come this one's a standard so it's set up for standard uh, line type geophysics data where you have an x and a y and a line number and a fiducial a line type be it a production line or a tie line 
flight number and a clearance field. So you have these standard fields which you can nom they can have any name you like, but their function can be uh, tagged by setting their alias. So this is the standard set of uh, aliases. And then for the marine case, uh, we have special, uh, just that tab there. We have uh, the velocity of the craft, the current azimuth of the craft, and its uh, shot point or fiducial. This is, of course, useful for or vital, actually, for creating the uh, uh, the ETFOS correction or the the the, uh, the moving gravity um, centripetal force correction um, uh, is is derived from these uh, measurements. If we're measuring um, <coughs> seaborne uh, gravity, often you'll have a uh, a lost Lacoste and Romberg style machine. Um, instrument and uh, that comes with uh, not only measurements of the uh, uh, onboard uh, quality control gravity measure but it's, com it's composed of uh, up to eight or nine uh, subsidiary measures uh, the beam and the spring tensions constitute the main gravity measures but there are other monitors of the uh, secondary and tertiary accelerations which are used to correct the uh, signal uh, and these are those that are listed there so that's the second section of the alias the third section down below um, <coughs> is set up for uh, if you are measuring um, gravity gradiometry or tensor data um, onshore or uh, in airborne and this is a way of setting up the uh, feels for the uh, as it's measured before you create the actual tensor from the uh, from the uh, the measured components so this is a small section on alias management just to give you an insight into the formalism uh, once you've set all these up all the tools uh, in intrepid are aware of these aliases and if they need to uh, access these uh, factors in, in inside any one tool, you have them predefined. So you only have to set it up once and then from a systematic point of view the job's done and when you come to do that particular job the alias uh, will take care of it under the hood for you. So <coughs> once you've uh, got the data imported and you've got the aliases set uh, we can uh, often create additional columns um, to uh, supplement or transform some of the uh, data that's been given into a more standard form. This can be done using a spreadsheet editor and in particular the, the job that you usually find is you have to create a date time field uh, that is uh, common and uh, ubiquitous and useful. Um, so the, the date time together with the line identifier becomes the key for merging geophysics data from different sources together. So the spreadsheet editor, we're just popping up the, uh, the tool in the background and we're creating, uh, popping up the create new field and in this case in this database we have a field down here called GPS time which we're choosing to divide by 3600 which will convert seconds into uh, decimal hours. So this is, uh, you may wish to uh, run your time um, on decimal hours <coughs> uh, since uh, midnight for any one day. Um, uh, that's typically what you might do. Now having created uh, uh, a navigation file with lines and uh, uh, a decimal hours field in it, you might also have the uh, same information in a separate database but recorded at a different uh, frequency like the gravity data at one record per second and the navigation say at, uh, at uh, five times a second so we need to interpolate the navigation data back in, into the geophysics data and the common or the key fields would be the GPS time and the file number. We have a tool uh, called the Merge Dataset tool which is available from the project manager and we just simply select, select that and that pops up the tool. It's a very simple tool. You select the two databases you wish to merge 
so you have the, the navigation field uh, database which you wish to merge with the gravity one and the rules uh, for how to do it uh, descri described in the in the uh, on-screen wizard there once you've uh, got those preconditions you hit the next button and you're then asked to pick out uh, fields from the uh, in this case the navigation database which you wish to merge in with the uh, <coughs> with the uh, gravity data at this stage the gravity was just a time series without being located in X and Y we're adding that to the uh, to that uh, gravity database and uh, there it is the key fields the station number and the line number so having uh, done that for one day uh, you may now have maybe 20 or 30 days of data uh, uh, typically a contractor might produce uh, ASCII files of navigation and gravity by day and then you want to wish one, create one database with everything all integrated together into one master database so having got one day's data organized we can append those to create a, a data set which uh, encompasses all and this is done through the append tool so in, once again in the project manager under data set choose append and as with the merge you simply say I now want to put day 151 Julian day 151's data on the back of data from 150 and as long as they share the same fields uh, the job is uh, just easily achieved with the click of one button there the next button and you just uh, select all the fields from the day 551 to add to the existing one hit the finish and it goes so this brings us to uh, the end of uh, stage one the data preparation it's just a lightweight uh, quick look at the sorts of processes that are involved and the tools can do the next job is the data cleaning job Cleaning involves anything from despiking and filtering and adding auxiliary columns to looking for steps and jumps and path cleaning and uh, duplication of readings at the same, uh, same location in space. So <coughs> often uh, the situation is the, sh the ship might go around in circles or is stationary and there's unnecessary uh, uh, data there. Um, uh, often you run into the problem of uh, or deciding what has been used as the null. Intrepid has a standard uh, and fo most a very formal uh, way of describing what the null in your data should be. Um, and this is right across all tools. It's uh, uh, one of the things that distinguishes uh, geophysics uh, is in fact the formalism associated with uh, declaring a null reading to be a null and not to be confused with any other numeric data like zero or minus 999 or some such thing. Null is null. Um, so we have a formal null process and it's up to uh, you as part of this process of getting the data in to uh, also make sure you've got null properly declared as null. So having got, uh, depending on the status of the data, the, these pre-processing steps which I'll now go into may need to be looked at. The first, uh, one of the things you're really trying to do is QC the data and get some um, idea of uh, now that you've created a database, what does it look like in toto. One way to do that is to, and the way we recommend, is to have a look at some profiles of the data. Um, so we have a tool, a simple tool is this profile editor, it's one way of doing it and you bring in, in this case you've got, uh, we're just looking at navigation data in fact here, we've got an east field and a north field with some sort of uh, trace of the data but uh, the first thing uh, we've done is put a, um, <coughs> a fourth difference operator across those two fields so you have the original east as it's delivered and then with the fourth difference operator and you can see the noise so it's a, it, while it's a low level noise it shows some uncertainty in position in the uh, in the uh, in the
in the location. So the top one doesn't have a filter, but uh, the, the, this, it's repeated and applies the fourth difference uh, when you, when you uh, bring it in again for a second time. Now having got uh, this type of uh, display up, uh, you can navigate and uh, move around from next and previous and start just look at each of the lines and you'll see some spikes. Now you might judge them to be uh, acceptable or not depending on uh, depending on uh, uh, what you what you feel so up the top here we're seeing um, yeah, 500 um, 500 meter uh, line spacing going north and f uh, and 500 meter line spacing going east so we've got diagonal uh, a diagonal trace and uh, there's some wrapping there but that's okay um, and we're just looking at the noise in the, in the GPS data. Now if you choose to uh, uh, edit this and get rid of those spikes because you don't like them you simply uh, run your mouse and uh, over the bit that you want either down here in the spike finder and it will highlight the number of samples, little points along them you can cut and interpolate or you can spline across the, the cut so that you can interpolate either side, the good readings either side to fix up and remove a spike. Another way of, uh, that was the profile only way of uh, looking at your data which we strongly recommend early on. Another way of looking at of course is in map view with linked uh, uh, profile plots and spreadsheet plots so you can have the data, the three-way view of the same data and here we have the 3D Explore tool uh, which is being used to link the line data and maps and display the value uh, in a spreadsheet view, a profile view and a map view simultaneously and you can just sort of click in any one view and the cursor will go uh, in the other views to exactly that sample point and that's a good way to also uh, uh, clean up or examine anything in the data that you, you feel you might feel worried about. You can see here the, the typical um, uh, situation where the, sh the ship might go around in circles or might uh, re, uh, uh, reset and come back onto the line and start again or there's the turn here as it goes around and comes back to start the next line. This is very typical of raw uh, navigation data as it's collected at sea. One of the uh, steps you do quite early on uh, is to uh, sometimes filter the data on a time basis rather than uh, spatially and uh, <coughs> uh, this is uh, a noise reduction filter and it can be done on the geophysics and the auxiliary data and standard uh, filtering options that are available so under the filtering menu you get the line filter and a variety of convolution let's have a look and see what you've got so the first uh, if you pop up the line filter tool having chosen that gravity database that we've just uh, created you can look for spatial convolution methods uh, we're recommending the now the non-linear spike remover or the in this case that's one option and that's uh, uh, quite a good and powerful one. Another one if you go to the f spectral domain um, finite impact response Fourier methods you have the usual shopping list of band pass, low pass, vertical derivatives, continuations and uh, components and uh, Hilbert transforms. There's a shopping list of uh, and there's, there's much more extensive than this again uh, available and you can um, just instantly choose and see the impact of that particular filter uh, the top panel is the raw is the unfiltered data and the bottom panel shows you the same data but transformed by the uh, by the filter so for marine data a good noise removal strategy is a combination of a nonlinear nowdy and then smoothing it with a fuller. So ship track data has to be cleaned to 
cut out sharp changes in direction which may which uh, causes uh, unwanted lateral accelerations and uh, spikes in the gravity reading they're not real uh, uh, so the leveling process requires uh, reasonably straight segments to facilitate the calculations of crossovers so we take the the cruise information where the ship goes up and back and around and we break it up into straight line segments and we eliminate basically the turns anything that's uh, where the ship is uh, is turning as being unreliable and uh, that's the basic aim so we want to get the straight line segments and throw away the turns now the preparing ship tracks for data there's a under leveling there's a tool called marine split and it's this tool uh, does this splitting automatically after all the parameters are set uh, and you can see the parameters uh, here when you pop up the uh, split cruise tool uh, and choose your database uh, you've got the input and the output database you can say what is the sharp angle uh, the trend angle tolerance coming into the turn and uh, how many samples before the turn minimal samples after the drop and the maximum distance between samples so uh, uh, if there's uh, not much data that's been collected it's better to not uh, not chop it out you need to have a, a, a regularly sampled signal for this to make any sense at all. The, the option down the bottom there of preserving all raw data uh, enables you to create a turns database. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it sort of nulls out the X and the Y, uh, as I recall, uh, but uh, preserves the data in the database. So it takes no further part in the uh, leveling, but does actually preserve the the uh, uh, the raw um, the data uh, as it was collected. It's one of the design features in this particular tool. Okay, now if you don't like the automation that this split cruise uh, tool offers, it is possible, of course, to manually uh, do this process, and it can be tedious. Uh, to do that, you'd set up flag fields and you'd go along and you'd flag which portion of the lines you want to preserve and which ones you, you don't and you can use the uh, say the spreadsheet editor to uh, uh, just write out the navigation for those parts of the lines that uh, you want to use. Uh, this is a particularly tedious way of doing it compared to this automated uh, tool not to be recommended unless you absolutely are desperate. So this uh, brings us to the end of a first uh, pass look at data cleaning. Uh, so we've more or less got our data uh, into in a database. We've got it broken up into lines, straight line segments. We've got rid of the worst of the spikes, and uh, we might have put a uh, yeah. We've, we haven't uh, particularly low pass filtered or anything. We've just gone after the. Uh, the more obvious uh, uh, trouble spots and got it uh, into a state that you can then uh, hopefully get a coherent uh, representation of the potential field from. So this moves us on to the next stage, the basic processing, uh, and I'll cover each one of those as we get to them. So you may wish to convert the, the data to from uh, meter re units to milligals. Uh, for marine uh, gravity, one of the things that you may want to do is decorrelate uh, the uh, wave noise from the raw measured gravity signal, and you have you have to uh, account for the earth tide correction. Um, it's better to back out any tidal effects to normalize it. Uh, the motion of the ship uh, in itself causes a, a quite a considerable uh, signal to the uh, to the gravity, so that's called the Etfos correction, and that can be calculated and backed out of the 
the signal so that you come up with a pseudo-static uh, version of the gravity field even though it was collected on a ship and if you're uh, also working on magnetic data uh, there's uh, diurnal effects, daily effects uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the magnetic uh, field that you've uh, collected and this can be backed out as well it's typical of the type of uh, uh, corrections uh, they're still fairly big corrections but uh, they're important to get those first order corrections done <coughs> and finally typically you might also uh, check for instrument drift uh, you have a still reading before the cruise starts uh, leaving say a port and when it comes back to port you check to see whether the meter gives the same reading that it uh, gave on the way out and uh, uh, if there was no drift that's great uh, if there's a small drift you can uh, apply that uh, sort of assuming the, a uniform drift over the, the course of the cruise so taking those uh, factors one at a time the delivered counter readings have to be converted to milligals typically uh, Intrepid can reconstruct the uh, gravity values from the raw readings in order to do this uh, you have to have set those uh, aliases as I've mentioned previously uh, for depending on what the instrument is and uh, for some of the instruments there are calibration parameters which convert from a meter value to a uh, milligal value say and these uh, lookup tables for the conversion uh, uh, by convention are located in a file called gravimeter.config and we just simply add the uh, instrument uh, calibration table to that figure, so to that file, so that when the tool goes to do the uh, correction, it knows where to go to find the uh, lookup table. Uh, other instruments already uh, have the data delivered in milligals or counter county or counter units, uh, and if necessary, you can, uh, if it's a simple uh, conversion. Uh, that, a, that a formula um, or spreadsheet editor uh, formula uh, tool can uh, manage uh, this could also be accomplished quite easily in our spreadsheet editor looking there now at the uh, ETFOS and Tidal type corrections this is a relatively straightforward correction which is based on the uh, time of day position, the speed of the moving air, uh, moving uh, ship. So you, we fire up the uh, gravity tool and under process there's a, an item there called gravity transforms. Uh, once the transform is chosen you might be prompted for additional parameters or fields or the aliases might uh, uh, be set so alleviating you the need to reset the fields in question. The ETFOS correction requires a velocity and the bearing and for tidal correction the Julian day and time of day will be needed as well as the X and uh, the easting and the northing. So having chosen the gravity transform you can uh, choose in this case the ETFOS correction or the earth tide correction, they're the two we're talking about or if you've got a previously uh, calculated ETFOS correction from someone else uh, you can reverse that into a velocity and check whether whether you agree with that or not that's part of the, the QC so the aim with the Intrepid tools is to provide the reverse transform as well as the forward transform so if you want to uh, back out of uh, someone else's work or back out of your own work and check that it all works you have the uh, the uh, two-way street to allow you to do that. <coughs> Perhaps one of the uh, most famous uh, corrections for moving platform gravity uh, is the decorrelation technique which uh, Lucien Lacoste uh, developed uh, over many years um, funded largely by the US Navy in the first instance and uh, he developed a uh, strategy for removing uh, uh, the uh, stabilised observation platform accelerations from the uh, uh, 
observed signal and these uh, uh, what we're talking about there is that uh, on a ship the uh, ship is being buffeted around by waves and the weather and the wind and these are characteristic extra accelerations which of course get uh, added into the observed gravity and it's confusing the uh, the picture because it's not gravity at all it's just the ship being buffeted about but uh, it, the good work that was done by the cost was to uh, add extra monitors of this uh, of all sorts of uh, derivatives of the acceleration uh, onto the stabilized platform and by observing the second order motions along with the gravity uh, a cross correlation uh, at expected wavelengths of the motion uh, can be uh, deduced and those accelerations then removed. So let's just having a look at this here. Let's explain some of these uh, graphs. So the <coughs> uh, typically the observed gravity might be something like this blue dotted line and, uh, and that includes wave noise uh, type uh, motion and we've got uh, time you know half every half hour we're correcting a, along a profile of data. So there's uh, wave noises in there and we actually wish to extract or back out the action of the waves noise so that we're left with the uh, corrected gravity. One of the most important aspects of that is to actually apply a common filter to both the observed raw gravity and these monitors and Lucian uh, invented uh, Famously, his RC filter, and that's shown here as an electrical um, resistor capacitor type uh, diagram uh, in series, applying one, two, three times. And the, one of the important characteristics of this type of filter, uh, while it smooths the data, it still preserves the fundamental offset. There's no detrending. It preserves the DC offset so that you, when you uh, multiply the decorrelation uh, coefficients uh, it effectively can take out the wave noise uh, motion. This is a wonderful invention and of course it's uh, uh, <coughs> intrepid. We're lucky in uh, being able to get hold of Lucian's original um, basic program that he wrote uh, in his original implementation and uh, talking with um, her Valiant uh, he has sort of handed it over to us and uh, went through it all and we calibrated and did our own implementation directly uh, in a line from the, from the original inventor. Part of the uh, process of uh, also uh, <coughs> working on marine gravity with this particular type of technology, uh, not only do you uh, get access to that filter in the line filter tool that I just described, the RC filter. So it's one of the special filters that's in there. Uh, we pass, and as I mentioned, we pass all the monitors through that filter, which includes the VCC, AL, AX, etc. These monitors uh, often are usually acquired uh, 25 hertz and uh, logged at one second intervals. And we have a job uh, which uh, we give out to uh, as a standard um, giveaway in the training for this type of technology where we give you a way of uh, <coughs> uh, setting up a, a standard filtering job to apply to all these, uh, all these monitors. A second step is to uh, not believe the original um, may believe the original recorded gravity that comes with the with the instrument but there's also the possibility of reconstructing uh, from its components the gravity and here we're doing that in our profile editor and you can see there's a lag there's a hardware lag and it's true that the real-time gravity uh, signal that you get on the ship as a QC measure has a 300 second lag in it so that when you reconstruct the signal, uh, the reconstructed signal moves back 300 uh, seconds um, or five minutes. Uh, 
uh, this was the uh, convention uh, that was applying for this particular uh, snap at the time. One of the other tasks of data processing at this stage is to also check the uh, uh, for the drift as you leave port you take a, a measure of the uh, meter reading uh, at the standard location and when you return uh, you take a, another meter reading uh, to verify that you get the same value if you don't um, this is what we call the good still readings um, and they, these can be subtracted from the gravity data. Equally the measured data can be DC shifted to absolute values so if you have a uh, not only a relative measure at the port but also the absolute value uh, that's a standard part of the process. All these jobs are easily accomplished in um, using once again the spreadsheet editor or part of the marine level tool is in a batch option. Over the left here we have just a, a notepad type um, uh, ASCII text which shows you the uh, <coughs> the batch process job where we're specifying a batch process for the DB Edit tool. You're opening a database, you're creating a new field and you're calling it uh, uh, minimum time and it's a IEEE double precision number and you're taking the, uh, you're wanting to find the starting uh, GPS time, the minimum, and then you uh, take the, you create a, a trend field uh, where you say the initial value is the current GPS mine and the minimum times multiplied by the slope, uh, which is the number, which is the drift, milligals per day, minus 0 0.0257 milligals per day has been uh, deduced to be the, the metre drift and dividing it by the number of seconds in the day and having got a trend field we take the uh, <coughs> the uh, output field which will be uh, called the gravity EDFOS trip field which has got a, a macro there being used to uh, specify what the output field would be and the initial value is the measured uh, gravity after the EDFOS correction uh, plus the trend correction so this is a, a prescriptive way of demonstrating how to do the uh, drift correction for every uh, progressively during the, uh, the day's readings. This brings us to the end of the basic processing stage. We're now going to have a look at uh, some marine levelling capability. The example over here on the, the right-hand side is actually Bass Strait uh, between Victoria and Tasmania. And it's fairly shallow water, up to 80 metres depth. And when this job was done some years ago, uh, you can see uh, sort of some still evidence of the, the ship tracks, even though more or less it's been uh, uh, reasonably well coherently uh, put together on the left hand side. But by the application of these uh, levelling tools, which we're going to describe in a minute, we can make that disappear so that you don't see the uh, ship tracks uh, anymore and uh, the eye can concentrate on the fact that you've got uh, <coughs> you know a gravity low in the middle of the Bass Strait uh, in this basin there that's a gas producing area uh, and then as you come back towards Tasmania and the islands uh, uh, it uh, you get to sort of a, a small amount of a shallower water and a and uh, a more uh, a more competent uh, uh, geological unit there. So, what is the definition of leveling? Well, you want to uh, you want to uh, remove the instrument drift and the diurnal variations. And uh, after you've done the systematic corrections, there's always some sort of residual uh, bit that the your systematic errors haven't been able to uh, to uh, for it to figure out. So you may wish to either spread that error out or find some other way of, uh, of get getting rid of this this last little bit of uh, <coughs> of inconsistency in your survey data. That's what we call leveling. Now, marine leveling um, 
there are two basic options which we present with our tool which has been uh, heavily used as I said for up to 15 years on all sorts of weird and wonderful variations on the problem and it's reduced down to uh, this idea that you level one data set so it's consistent with itself or you might have multiple data sets uh, and you progressively uh, uh, <coughs> build up a reference data set and you level new data sets with regards to the uh, ongoing uh, reference data set building up the reference set as you add another data set in I've sometimes considered that like an onion skin strategy where you have the high, the high uh, confidence data that you start with and then you progressively uh, bring up all the other data sets so they're consistent with that original core and spreading out, uh, spreading out the influence of, that, uh, of those original uh, observations. Now to achieve that there are quite a few uh, levelling methods. The, uh, the classic uh, plane tabling loop levelling or loop adjustment which is uh, it's a network uh, around uh, um, four crossovers that form a, a closed loop uh, that has proved to be very very effective for gravity uh, sometimes you might find that uh, one entire data set uh, is uh, just has a slightly different level to the others so uh, even by a just you know gravity is notorious for being a measure of relative uh, density variations and uh, uh, the absolute value of, the, of gravity is uh, particularly difficult to get and sometimes it's quite justifiable to do a small DC shift to the whole data set um, the, set, the third method uh, was developed uh, in response to the fact that uh, ship track data in detail have, might have all the high frequencies right but the level of the overall data set might be uh, inconsistent say with the satellite data uh, the long wavelengths from the satellite so this method is uh, often used when you have a satellite uh, long, long wavelength uh, reference data set and you wish to uh, drape the high frequency content uh, but you're not so worried about the long wavelength content of your uh, of your ship track data. <coughs> the next one is another variation on the DC where you're actually uh, shifting lines rather than the whole data set you're shifting lines individually. Uh, there, is a, there is a level surface method which I won't describe at the moment and the other workhorse method for leveling, uh, the polynomial method uh, that's uh, historically been developed largely for magnetics but we've found it also very useful for bathymetry and or occasionally for gravity as well and you're uh, at the crossovers between one ties or one data set and another you might find misfits and it's possible to develop a, uh, uh, a polynomial which uh, a moving a moving window uh, um, moving polynomial fit that moves down a line looking at all the crossovers and does local fitting to uh, just uh, tidy up the misfits. Uh, we'll talk about that some more in a sec. So <coughs> here we are looking using 3D Explore to uh, have a, uh, uh, a tight survey in a little bay um, and uh, you can see on different days color coded there's green blue and red and a, and, a, and a purple so there are four days of data and each uh, day has been uh, color coded slightly differently and some lines don't cross with any others so mostly there's a crossover between one line and and other lines. It's very difficult to see one that doesn't cross but uh, yes I think they all cross and in this case there's 80,000 measurements of gravity in this little bay. 
So there's a, a by cruise option. This option is set to include lines or line segments that do not cross any other line in the levelling process if that's the, the case so that you can uh, <coughs> follow through on a time basis uh, what adjustments you made uh, one portion of the cruise because it crossed over and then it uh, uh, you can make that same force that uh, same correction all the way along the rest of those the, the day's readings uh, in time if that's required um, the um, often the aim is to uh, dampen out the changes uh, away from where you have uh, your control there's no point changing the data if it's uh, if you have no control over or, or no uh, you know, scientific or observational reason to change the data. If the data was observed and there's no other data that disputes it, why would you change it? Uh, the only place you're going to change it is at the crossovers where there's a, an inconsistency. So we uh, <coughs> we have uh, techniques for uh, allowing you to do that uh, and waiting uh, one crossovers uh, 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 inconsistency with another. Uh, you can say they're all equally valid, that's the unity effect, or if the gradient of the signal was uh, <coughs> very high at one crossover and not very high at another, well you'd believe the one where the gradient wasn't very high, so that's the inverse gradient method, and uh, if that's too tough you can use the square root. The uh, the fifth one there, the inverse signal was invented for bathymetry. The deep water uh, crossovers uh, might appear to be a huge uh, difference, uh, you know, in hundreds of metres of water depth, but if it's at five kilometres uh, depth, that should have uh, not as much influence as, uh, you know, five metres in, uh, in uh, 20 metres of shallow water. So that's an obvious uh, different weighting system for, for bathymetry, which is in this tool. Of course, uh, uh, marine levelling, you have a relatively chaotic uh, uh, design of uh, surveys, and especially when you have multiple surveys which uh, collide with each other. Uh, you have to be able to cope with uh, some lines not having crossovers and others having too many crossovers and crossovers that are too close to each other uh, causing unrealistically high gradients so you want to ignore, uh, ignore some in that situation uh, crossovers that are too far away from the point of measurement I'd already uh, men measured that uh, mentioned that and uh, if you wish to apply a correction uh, using a polynomial, uh, you don't want to do that at a distance which is too far away from the original uh, uh, justific your justification of why you wanted to change it. So this, they, uh, they have a method for dying out. Lines without crossovers can be uh, treated as well by setting the by cruise option which I spoke to a little bit before but usually the only justification for doing anything is the DC one in that case it's possible to do uh, one survey against the other as we've said before and that, come, that plays into the whole discussion about using regional or satellite data. So marine levelling uh, uh, functionality uh, <coughs> can be uh, accessed uh, through the uh, in this case we've, we're showing a pro batch file with, pro with it's all been set up to uh, show you the options and the processes. The language for the, the batch language is now formalized in, uh, in a Google Protobuf uh, lexicon uh, which we publish. So all of the parameters plus uh, comments and the ranges and the usual defaults are now uh, fully documented. But in this case here we're showing an actual batch job uh, with the comment uh, uh, the hash character being the comment field so the job that we want to do in this case is a loop level and all the other options are turned off by the hashtag and we're not doing by cruise that's turned off 
and we're saying we've got some input crossovers which we previously calculated and these are the uh, there's an input data set prior to leveling and the output is the data set which is going to be loop leveled and we have the easting and the northing uh, uh, geolocation uh, fields in that database and there's a report file that's been uh, fully uh, an ASCII report file that gets uh, written to progressively with a full account of the uh, uh, of the task at hand including uh, running report on each line and what the crossovers were and how the adjustment was going and how well it fitted and including things like population analysis uh, uh, you can uh, ask to save empty groups in crossovers and you can ignore crossovers that are within 100 uh, FID units uh, of each other just pick one of them and uh, if there's a kilometer uh, if, the, if uh, one point is separated by 50 kilometers from another well they'll have no influence on each other and uh, in this case here you're not allowed to interpolate more than um, 500 meters from one reading to the next. We're setting up for a polynomial um, adjustment uh, of the uh, due, due to the uh, misfits at the crossovers and we're uh, having a window of uh, five uh, first order polynomial and uh, it's distance weighted. So they're the, the sorts of uh, options that you get uh, in this tool. This brings us uh, to the uh, uh, the final uh, phase of the workflow uh, tools that we have available and uh, it's an important part of the process that having uh, created a profile, uh, a database with the profile seemingly consistent you actually have to prove to yourself and to all others that uh, you're actually being able to produce a coherent uh, representation of say the gravity or the magnetic field or the bathymetry uh, that uh, looks good and makes sense and is consistent with the data that was gathered. So <clears throat> the best way to do that or the traditional way of doing that is by the process of gridding to get a continuous information over the whole survey area. Uh, most gridding routines require a regular survey layout. Uh, um, that's not strictly true. Uh, with the Intrepid tools we've uh, worked out all sorts of ways to extend the uh, ability of the gridding to, uh, to cope with uh, poorly sampled and alias data sets but uh, there's a limit. You can't create, uh, you can't create a good representation uh, of the field if, the, if you don't have the actual basic data that's going to stand up to it. So once you've gridded the data you might uh, find that there are still artifacts uh, so there's uh, at the gridding level there's a, 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 another leveling process called decorrugation which might be uh, uh, necessary and grids are filtered for a variety of reason, reasons to uh, you know a lot of them is for QC you want to look at residuals to see just what data problems are hiding inside the data still and uh, uh, and that's what we'd recommend. Uh, of course you can hide your problems but it's probably better to step to uh, to face up to them. So let's have a look at some of these processes. A couple of slides about Marine Bougay. Marine Bougay is similar to Simple Bougay uh, with the important difference being that the offshore instead of the uh, topographic correction being a positive one the use the bathymetry, uh, the, uh, the seawater is assumed to uh, be on the geoid and the bathymetry is covered with uh, seawater therefore you back out the density of the seawater and replace it with the crustal density difference of approximately say 1.64. This makes a very large adjustment uh, across the continental shelf a reg a region and it has the very positive effect 
of reducing the false uh, free air high on the shelf boundary. Uh, this uh, has been uh, for the un uninitiated often uh, in interpreted uh, as some sort of density high when really it's uh, a result of uh, crustal thinning. The rate of crustal thinning at the uh, at the near surface is uh, much sharper than the deeper thinning uh, at the ocean onshore crustal boundary. An example of integrating onshore data, land data, with offshore data, ship track data. This example comes from southern Australia. Uh, to the north we have Victoria, and we have the island of Tasmania and some of the smaller islands that are well covered by traditional land-based observations of gravity. And here we have the ship track data uh, that was collected maybe up to 10 years ago as an example. And the aim here is to create a bouguet correction uh, both onshore and offshore which is completely consistent. The uh, mountainous region here is still showing a bouguet low so the uh, <coughs> isostatic correction can help uh, that would follow this, uh, this part of the work would help uh, compensate for the deep roots of the mountains in this area here. Uh, leaving that issue aside you can see the uh, Bass Strait, Tasmania and Victoria joining quite well and over here in the Western District there's indications of some circular deep uh, volcanic type uh, material yeah, it's recent volcanic uh, type uh, province and then offshore we have the uh, <coughs> the ocean crust uh, area starting to show the Bouguet High. Just to be clear about this effect and reaching back into the early textbooks the uh, expectation is that as you move uh, from uh, continental crust regions to the ocean crust regions the Bouguet anomaly will go to a high positive number as seen by this graph there. So this is uh, well known and you should always expect to see that effect as you're doing this type of work. This is the greeting is the simplest one and the intrepid uh, under the greeting menu. Line data are gridded to uh, do the job so let's just uh, pop up the gridding tool you can see the in the input panel you've chosen that data set and uh, uh, you've got the Bouguet field that's been uh, uh, chosen as the data that you want to grid in this case and we're going to just do uh, the method will be the nearest neighbor method uh, which is the default and the output grid uh, we just choose the default and the cell size of say 620 meters uh, and that's 400 or about approximately 500 by 500 grid and that's a, a reasonable first approximation hit the go button and uh, I'm only showing you that grid uh, a different grid at the moment uh, uh, this is one with where you can see there's a bust in the data having gridded it and the reason for showing this is it's an introduction to the decorrugation process if you wish to remove that artifact uh, if it's if you see something systematic still in the tool uh, in your data after everything else has been done and you know it's not uh, it's, it's you know it's not uh, geological it's somehow uh, associated with the acquisition of the data uh, you can apply this method to get rid of it so uh, sometimes you may have to uh, rotate the data uh, to get the uh, artifact to line up either along a row or along a column this can be done using the grid operations tool and picking the rotation method you then, uh, if you wanted to decorrugate, you'd choose uh, the decorrugation tool and specify the grid. And spe uh, I would just use the defaults. Uh, most intrepid tools are set up. Those are the defaults for filters and things like that are very sensible. Uh, I wouldn't touch those. Uh, and you want to have a look at 
the level grid rather than the corrections grid and that would be that's how you would do a decorrugation job and fix that up another way of getting um, uh, having a look at uh, your data once it's been gridded is to have a look at the uh, uh, put the uh, <coughs> the gridded data into a grid filter and then start to do um, residual filters or high pass filters etc so in this case a high pass filter has been chosen and on the uh, complete bugue so that is the grid that uh, we were missing from the gridding job that's been created by that prior gridding job and it's uh, the complete bougie so Notion it's had a terrain correction done to it as well and we've uh, um, sorry with this in this case is a low pass filters being chosen and the uh, uh, it's taken out some of the uh, higher wavelength there, not much but a little bit uh, and it's just done by clicking that button and designing your filter and off you go. <coughs> that was done using Fourier domain filtering uh, of course there's uh, convolution filtering, uh, spatial convolution filtering options as well uh, the standard ones of just uh, sharpening the data with uh, three point kernels and averaging and three, five, seven, nine biasing in one direction or another they're all available standard sort of uh, local filtering there's a there's a, uh, a mimic of the weights of the kernel that to be applied and what do you do at the edges do you chop and null and normalize all the good stuff so uh, this brings us to um, the, uh, the end of the overview of the uh, tool sets uh, that, that typically used um, to create a, uh, a processing flow for marine levelling. What we haven't done of course is given examples of magnetics or bathymetry. Uh, all I can say is they follow uh, similar, uh, similar lines but each of those data types has their own particular twists as well. Uh, if you'd like to uh, have a further look at uh, some of these now that we've introduced this capability to you uh, please contact the uh, office uh, through the website and request uh, an evaluation and we'd be uh, happy to uh, let you uh, have a look at some of these tools uh, when we uh, give you an evaluation we have small training data sets uh, that are online or get distributed and there's a uh, there's over uh, 90 different uh, manuals and uh, uh, books and uh, they include cookbooks and guided tours and reference manuals and tools manuals uh, some of which uh, I've alluded to today but there's a lot more of this material which uh, has been uh, put together over the last 15 years by the Intrepid team uh, thank you very much for your attention